David, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, first off, how long has your family been in the wine trade? Hey, um, yeah, nice to be here, Elliot. Good to see you. I think your, my family has known your family longer than you and I have been alive. You know, my family's been, my father, my grandfather, they've been in the industry since 1958. And uh, yeah, so I'm sort of third generation of, of winemaker and wine farmer here in the Western Cape in South Africa. It's quite a, it's quite a long history. I mean, if, if you look, it started off with, with what's now today in the Hartenburg Wine Estate. Um, and then there was Blauklippen, where I grew up. Uh, Glen Carlo was the winery where I started making wine with my father. And today I own my own vineyard, which is called Edgeston, and where I make the David Finlayson wines. Yeah, I think uh, Glen Carlo, I think, was where probably we first met when I was uh, probably 15 or 16, just uh, on rugby tour. <laughs> That's right. Um, Back when I had lots of hair when I was much younger. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so I've been around in the industry for, well, I don't know, 25 odd years now, I guess. It, it's, yeah, it'd be 25, 26 years since I've formally been a, a qualified winemaker. But I've, I mean, I started helping my dad when I was still at school. Um, and that would be 1989, was sort of as I was finishing high school. Um, I helped him make his first wines at, uh, in, in the tractor shed at Glen Carlo before there was a proper winery in there. So, yeah, I've been at it for a while. Uh, so, David, where did the name Edgebaston come from? Well, Edgebaston is, is the actual vineyard that we live on and where we grow about half of our grapes that we uh, turn into our, into our wines. But, you know, the business has grown from uh, 6,000 cases of production to 30,000 cases of production over the past 15 years. And um, because of that, we, we had to start sourcing from other long-term growers that we deal with. And because I decided, you know, we're not an estate and Edgerson is very much the sort of estate name uh, that we used to have on the wines. And we, we've now changed the name to David Finlayson Wines, which reflects more of my winemaking across four different properties from False Bay Coast all the way through to on the border with Paul. So, um, you know, we, we're going to be calling the wines and we have started and we are calling them from now on David Finlayson Wines as opposed to just Edgerson Vineyard. Nice, gives you a lot more uh, scope of different parcels to work with, different climates, different soils. That's, uh, what, what sort of uh, um, grape varieties are you sourcing from Edgebaston and then the ones from the other three locations? Yeah, so on the, on the coastal locations, we're getting more things like Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc, which, which you know, prefer really cool, sort of those cool evening breezes being very close to the ocean. They, I mean, they're about three, four miles from the sea. Um, and then we focus on the Cabernet Sauvignon section right here, um, in, you know, on the edge of um, Chardonnay, we're getting some from Stellenbosch Mountain, and then we're also getting some Chardonnay right on the border with um, Stellenbosch and Paul, which, and Chardonnay, as you know, enjoys a bit of heat. Um, it can handle a bit of warmth. So th that is just giving us more scope by having more sites from which to, to, to sort of bring, you know, fruit in to the winery here. And uh, so, I guess, always destined to join the wine industry, making wine. Was there anything else that you fancy doing that, uh, that sparked your interest? I mean, initially, I thought I'd be a journalist. And funnily enough, I mean, I was never very good at maths at school. So languages were sort of my favorite. And um, I thought maybe journalism was, would be good fun until somebody told me that journalists make even less money than winemakers. So I decided, no, I'll give that a skip. Um, and besides that, if you're in a war zone, you probably get your head shot off. So safer to be a winemaker, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Very good. And so great varieties wise, you've always uh, liked working with Cabernet, I guess. What, what sort of led you to pick the great varieties that you work with on the Edge Baston Vineyard? Yeah, I mean, Cabernet is sort of Cab is king. And, and I grew up literally in the household from as, when I was knee high, the, word, the wine and variety I always heard of was Cabernet Sauvignon. So, so as far as reds go, um, that's definitely always been sort of the benchmark for me. And then for many years, obviously, Glen Carlo, uh, Chardonnay sort of became a very powerful variety in, in our family and put us on the world map with the first uh, 90 point South African wine in, in America and that sort of thing. Um, and it's been my focus, but I've spent a lot of time in France between Burgundy and Bordeaux. Obviously, you know, when I go to Bordeaux, I focus on Cabernet and the Bordeaux varieties in the left bank. Uh, and when I go to Burgundy, I'm, you know, I stay in Merceau and places like that. And I love drinking, 
you know, really great white burgundy. Obviously, it's wonderful to drink Pinots from, from Burgundy as well, but uh, who can afford them nowadays? Anyway, so yeah, those are, I would say, as far as red goes, um, Cabernet is king and Chardonnay in the white is, is my favorite, yeah. So talking of uh, abroad, making wine abroad, where did you uh, did you do any vintages elsewhere before you finally settled down to your, do your own thing in, in, in South Africa? Yeah, yeah, obviously, I mean, I was very lucky as, uh, so I qualified as a winemaker formerly at Elson College in 1993. And as you know, South Africa had its first free elections and sort of the beginning of democracy in 1994. And that opened a lot of doorways. Uh, you know, suddenly South Africans were allowed to travel and go and work around the world. And so I, I got into the Barossa Valley at Peter Lehman Wines, where my father and Peter Lehman were friends. So I was able to go there. And I think I was the first South African to work in the Barossa Valley. Um, and so that was 1994, had a great vintage there, learned a heck of a lot under the Aussies, especially how to drink. Um, but yeah, besides that, also a bit about winemaking. Uh, and then 1995 was sort of the highlight of my career uh, as a young winemaker, going to work at Chateau Mongo in Bordeaux. And, and that really, I mean, so for me, that was a dream come true at that stage of my life. And even today, I still look back at it with incredibly fond memories and I learned so much there from, from the late Paul Pontalia. Yeah. What a nice experience. I guess Well, that, it sort of fits in perfectly as Australia is out and out new world, Margot out and out old world. And South Africa often gets uh, labelled uh, the, the, the newest old world, the com combination of the two. So is that something that you've found in making your wines as a, mixing a blend between old and new world styles? Yeah, sure. I mean, it really is true in terms of flavour profile and where the wines stand. Um, but as a winemaker, you can also kind of nudge towards one side or the other and um, I think over the years you know I've moved one way and then I've moved the other way and, and you know you spend a lifetime making styles of wines and then perhaps deciding you've reached a phase in life where you want to try something else so I, I would say for instance that I mean I spent a lot of time in Napa as well and in California and as a young winemaker I probably focused very much on new world um, in terms of Australian and California, making sure we had ripe uh, wines, wines without green tannins and green flavors and that sort of thing. And I think now I'm, I'm sort of reaching a stage in life where I, I'm moving back towards the fresher wines, perhaps slightly lower alcohols, perhaps there's a touch more um, sort of, you can call it greenness, but in a positive sense, again, you know, um, bringing that freshness back into the wines, not quite as as new world, if you want to call it, as they used to be, maybe a little bit more towards the old world. Yeah. Nice. So, how would you put? It's always interesting to hear how uh, winemakers put their region on the world stage. What what piece of the puzzle does Stellenbosch play uh, if on a wine list on a really esoteric wine list somewhere in Europe, for example? Uh, look, I mean, Stellenbosch is known as Cabernet. It, it is Cabernet country, yeah, and. It has to do with the geographics and the soils um, being that sort of fairly close to the ocean, but not right on top of the ocean. And then also not too far inland. This is the bowl, if you want to call it, of, that's created by the three mountains that surround Stellenbosch. Just fit perfectly to Cabernet Sauvignon and, and, you know, the other Bordeaux varieties do very well in the region as well. But on a global map, I mean, you have those extremes. You have that sort of extremely ripe style of, of have that you get in California and then you get the you know called relatively lean style in, in Europe and in, in Bordeaux where that or even in Italy where they often blend another variety into flesh or the grape out but in Stellenbosch Cabernet on its own can work well it doesn't necessarily need blending components it really expresses the variety and gives it its flavor profile and, and so on so yeah I think you know anybody safely says Stellenbosch Cabernet is is really um a hallmark you know of what great south african red wine can be yeah so okay if you weren't making cabernet you're somewhere else in the world obviously moving back to bordeaux or, and margot would be perhaps uh well a lot of winemakers dreams who make you make you make cabernet but what other great varieties might you like to get your hands on and um, of course you make quite a few great varieties yourself but what would be single great variety somewhere else in the world where would you, where would you go I, I was thinking about that i mean something strange that I would be interested in is Riesling, you know, proper German sure. Riesling. Um, I mean, that's so out of, so different, it's completely contrasting to what I make. Uh, and there's, even though we have fairly steep slopes here on, on Edgbaston, 
Um, I would imagine, you know, those, those slopes in Germany on the Mosul and, and the Rhine, just, I mean, and working on the slate and getting those really minerally kind of wines, low alcohol, but incredibly fresh. And it's just something that would be interesting, but I, I seriously doubt I'm ever going to end up doing it. So. <laughs> No, it's yeah. hypothetical, right? So I guess if you've got Riesling at one end of the spectrum and some of your big, like the GS Cab at the under, other end of the spectrum, very different, very, very different wines. Where What what do you like drinking day to day? What yeah. what will be your go-to? Yeah, for drinking, it depends. I'm really a, pers- a mood kind of person, so it depends on the mood and, and also the time of the year. I mean, if, if we are like now, it's getting hot and sunny and summery, you know, it'll be Rieslings or Chardonnays. Um, I'm personally, even though I make Sauvignon Blanc, I'm, I'm, I find Sauvignon Blanc sort of very often one-dimensional unless they are amongst the best Sauvignons in the world. So I like the wines that are layered and complex and that open up as you drink them and as you taste them. Yeah, so I would go for Riesling or, or for Chardonnay and the whites. And then in winter, you know, there'll be the heavy reds and even the ports. I mean, you know, South Africa, we're not allowed to call our port port we call cape vintage whatever that you produce here but i mean some of the fortified wines in this country are fantastic and if you can get these old these old wines that are hanging around still in cellars um, muscadels and things that are 40 50 60 years old i mean it's fantastic when you drink those in the middle of winter and you have a cape storm roaring outside yeah yeah nice nice so as a winemaker, quite a few roles you need to play from maybe perhaps even before winemaking. It's viticulturist, winemaker, salesperson, marketeer. What do you enjoy the most? Is it standing at Provine meeting all your customers from Europe or is it in the, in the farm and the vineyard first? What, what, where, where is your ideal? If you only had to pick one role that you play, what would it be? Yeah, I, don't, I mean, it's not, the very reason I'm in, in this industry is because there are so many components and to it and it's interesting and it makes life interesting and it, it's very seldom boring um I'm, I'm a gemini and i always say i just can't sort of focus on anything for, for two minutes and i'm always all over the show so I, I love it the fact that i'm you know one minute i'll be in the vineyards and i'm looking at the vineyards i'm working with the workers and telling them what what i'd like done the next time in the cellar tasting wine the next time on a, a zoom call to some guy in the uk um, you know, <laughs> and 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 that's the the joy of, of being in this um, in this industry and and doing what I do. Uh, I think and and working for myself and, and you know my family and and that's I really enjoy this whole this lifestyle that I live. It's a lifestyle. It's not a job. It's a lifestyle. So yeah, if anything, I would say tasting out of barrels is probably the most fun. But yeah, yeah seeing it's seeing what's uh, seeing the fruits of your labor before anyone else and seeing how it's really coming together yeah absolutely and so on that which have you had a vintage either whilst helping your dad or uh, of, of your own that is particularly sticks you on your memory for any good or bad reason just something that is etched there thinking that vintage it's it's always yeah. a i don't know most vintages are somewhat the challenge and and uh you know, people think it's all it's all wonderful and, and eerie fairy and unicorns and, and things and uh, making wine. But I mean, in two in the vintage two thousand, I almost died. I I got electric an electric shock uh, through my head and and uh, knocked me out cold. And you know, working on a piece of equipment. So that two thousand was not exactly my favorite vintage. But that's not because of the vintage. That's because of what happened to me. Um, so many things happen during vintage. You're always you're always busy and and when a tank uh, explodes, I remember it wasn't in my own winery, but working in Peter Lehman winery and, and uh, doing an addition and seeing, I think it was 20,000 liters of wine going up in the air because like in a foam ball. So things happen in wineries and it, you know, you look back and you laugh at it. Um, often there's quite a big financial sort of knock for, for the winery, but it makes it interesting. Um, and if we survive it, all the better. Um, I, so yeah, I mean, there were vintages like even recently, 2018, tough vintage, you know, the third year in the drought in the Cape. Vines were really starting to struggle, starting to shut down, even though we have drip irrigation, we couldn't, we didn't have enough water to give through the irrigation system. Um, and, and, you know, coaxing the vines to ripeness uh, and just praying for a bit of rain. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of a tough one. And it was almost more emotionally tough than, um, you know, than physically actually. With, yeah, there's nothing you can do physically, I guess. There's just, uh, yeah. just hope. 
what mother nature gives you, you know, so, so that, they made it tough. Um, but at the same time, 2015, 2017, just give some of the best fruit. Uh, if you're as a winemaker, you couldn't ask for better fruit to make great red wines in those two vintages. So, so you know, it, there's good and bad with it always. Um, yeah, yeah. We focus on the good. Could be good. So who, uh, for, or what part, seeing that the industry is a lifestyle, very much a holistic thing, um, where do you draw most of your in inspiration from? Or uh, who would you... Who or what do you look to to think? Ah, yes, this is what I'm. This is what I'm thriving for. Yeah, I would say as a as a young winemaker, I kind of looked up to my father, of course, and and other role models. You know, I mean, um, my father was twice winemaker of the year in South Africa and that sort of thing. So it's it's all great. Um, and and Paul Pontalier and Peter Lima and those were all fantastic people. A few big names. Few big names there to, of people to work uh, with. <laughs> Um, so you know, and, um, so then many people like that are, that I've met over the years that have uh, been inspiration. But as life changes, um, you know, I have a family. Um, my wife and my daughter and my son have all started. I mean, my kids are sort of almost totally grown up now, and suddenly they start coming in and they start bringing their thoughts into the business and. Um, we become they're very conscious about uh, environmental issues, about health issues. Um, so we've gone vegan because my daughter went vegan. Um, we we go organic because my wife is totally into organic farming and grows her own vegetables and that sort of thing. And um, we are we we're starting this year. We're going to start our conversion to to being certified as organic, even though we nice. farmed organically on many many sides for many years. So that's the kind of thing, you know, I would say at the moment, it's kind of very much a family oriented and drawing inspiration from each other. Four brains are better than one, you know. Um, so <laughs> that's how we're working on it now. Yeah, that's nice. So uh, all, I guess the, the, the other three are, uh, are very much sort of helping you steer the direction. But are there any sort of budding winemakers, son, daughter, they looking to study winemaking, come into the family business or just have an outsider? Uh, outside lean on at this stage you know i'm letting them do their own thing i'm, I'm getting more business sense talking into my head um you know and things like that so um learning a lot about business i think at this stage as far as winemaking goes i can teach them all something but um it, it's good to to learn and, and to open your mind and, and uh you know my dad was very very open to letting me come in with my ideas when i was a young winemaker and part of the, the family business back then so I'm, I've also learned to, to be open to listening to others as well and learning from them. So um, obviously, again, back to this whole lifestyle question, lots of eating, drinking. What, uh, what's your favourite wine of yours that t pairs with a, a favourite meal of yours that was, is just, uh, yeah, together they are greater than the sum of their parts? Yeah, well, I mean, as I said, my, my daughter's vegan. However, I'm not vegan. And I like, I like to definitely like a bit of uh, really good South African meat. So just a clarify. Um, I love my, yeah, <laughs> I, I love my Cabernet and, uh, and, you know, and a good filet. Um, so, you I'm know, that kind of thing. Um, Cabernet filet. I mean, sometimes the simplest things are, are the best things in life. And you don't need to, you don't need to over elaborate. I, I really have sort of gone off. You know, in 25 years, I've spent many years in restaurants doing food and wine pairings and, and you know, had the most incredible concoctions that put on plates in front of me by chefs. And it's amazing, but sometimes it, it, it just becomes too much. And sometimes getting back to basics, it's a bit like rugby, get back to basics and, you you know, it works. We can, you know, we know which team we can talk about with that. But anyway. Um, just won the, we're just so, on the sixth so nation, kind of, so I'm happy, I'm fine. The well, World Cup, we can yeah. forget about that. <laughs> Well done on the Six Nations. Okay. Anyway, um, we'll see you at the next World Cup. Yeah, we'll see. So I, I would just say um, focusing, focusing on, you know, good red wine, really good, well-made red wine. And I think it's always been a family trait. We've always made our wines to go with food. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking, yeah. Cab and steak. I think that cab and steak is a perfect note to end on. David, thank you so much for chatting for me. Um, I'm sure we'll hopefully see each other in person sometime soon. It's uh, when, who knows, but uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Cheers, Elliot. Cheers. Thanks. Keep well. And you. Bye-bye-bye. Thank you.